In addition to the price elasticity of demand, which we spent quite a bit of time on, there are three other elasticity calculations and concepts you want to be aware of. Uh, the second one was the price elasticity of supply. It's in a separate video. Take a quick look at that. This third one, we want to look at both the cross price elasticity and the income elasticity uh, concepts behind the demand curve. Cross price and income. Now, the way I write it, the cross price elasticity, I, I use the small Greek letter sigma, and let's say x comma y. And what I'm asking here is what happens to the sales of product X when there's some change in the price of product Y? If Pepsi prices go up, what do you suppose happens to the sale of Coca-Cola? Well, Pepsi's pretty expensive, and people say, I just assume mix my rum with, with some Coca-Cola, and they go buy more Coca-Cola. That's the kind of relationship we're looking at here. Uh, our calculation, it'll look very familiar to you, it's going to be the percentage change in the sales or purchases of good X, the first good mentioned here, when there is some percentage change in the price of good Y. We can do the math. We've done it a hundred times, right? Let's do one very quickly. Suppose we see that when the price of good Y in the first instance is $10, and then the price of good Y goes to $16. At the same time, we see that the quantity demanded of good X in the first instance was 100. But when the price of Y rose, the quantity demanded of good X in the second instance um, decreases to 80 units. Let's calculate the cross price elasticity right there very quickly. Um, Percentage change in quantity, right? Going to be the change in quantity over the average quantity. Percentage change in the price of the other goods, going to be 6 divided by 13, right? Change over the average, change over the average. And what do we see? Quantity decrease, so that's a negative change. Price here increase, so that's a positive change. So we're going to be looking at that, at, in this instance, at, at a negative coefficient. Now, what is this? This is 2 ninths times 13 over 6, which is 26 over 54, which is eh, something just a little bit less than 0 0.50. I'm going to guess, okay? This is about 0.48. The math, we can all do the math with the calculator. But remember, this has got a negative coefficient in front of it, or a negative sign. This is important. What happened here conceptually? When the price of one good went up, people bought less of this one. In other words, when the price of this one went up, good Y, they, people said, well, we don't need as much. So they bought less of Y. They also bought less of X because it is a complement for good Y. When you buy Y, you buy X. I don't want buying as much Y. I don't need as much X. So our rule is when the cross-price elasticity is negative as it is here, then we're dealing with complements. And when the cross price elasticity is positive, we're dealing with substitutes such as Coca Cola and Pepsi or Ford and Chevrolet's or something like that. So our cross price elasticity calculations, very straightforward the way we've always done them. What we have to remember is to keep an eye on the sign. Keep an eye on what's happening to determine if these goods are complements or substitutes and the degree to which the price of one affects the other. That's the cross price elasticity. Okay? The important there, element there is the sign of the coefficient. Negative sign for complements, positive sign for substitutes. Don't forget that. Now, let's pick it up now and do the income elasticity. I indicate the income elasticity, small Greek letter edit, which is the percentage change in the quantity of a good that people purchase when there is some percentage change in their income. M stands for income here. 
Okay? So if, for example, when incomes are at $20,000, we see that people buy um, 200 units of good X. And we further observe that when the income enjoyed by the population increases, let's go to, let it go to 24,000. Suppose we saw then that the sales of good X in the second instance decreased to 180 units. What's going on? People are making more money, but they're buying less of this good. So I'll give you a clue about something. What kind of good is this? Normal or inferior? It's an inferior good. More money, we'll buy less of it. Okay? Let's do the calculation very quickly. The change in quantity is 20. The average quantity is 190. The change in income is 4,000. The average income is 22,000. And we do a quick calculation. First, we get rid of all the zeros. And we have 2 over 19 times 22 over 4, which gives us 44 divided by what? 76. Oh, I don't know. That's a little over half. Make up a number. Let's say that that's equal to about 0 0.68. I'm guessing that, okay? No sweat. What we do want to particularly notice, though, is what is the sign of this coefficient for the income elasticity? What sign does it have? Well, we saw an increase in incomes. We saw a decrease in quantity. So we have a, what? A negative change over a positive change. The sign of the coefficient is negative. And so our general rule is when the income elasticity is greater than zero, means we have a normal good. If it's less than a zero, as we had here, negative, it's an inferior good. Pretty straightforward. Would be particularly important to you, by the way, for example, if you were running a grocery store. And if you saw the economy sinking into a recession, a lot of people losing jobs, having hours cut back. Sounds a little familiar. Would that change your mix of products that you would be selling in your grocery store? Would you, for example, be selling more beans and ramen noodles and fewer steak and lobster. And you better stock up appropriately. And you would want to know the degree to which a change in income affects the sales of the various products in your store. And so this information becomes crucial to maximizing your profit or maybe even to surviving. So all these concepts do have some application in the real world. Thank you.